Last Sunday, you had a Lutheran, a female Lutheran pastor who had been Pentecostal. So uh, I came up to the Missouri Synod, and uh, in 1971, uh, my class all went back for their fifth year reunion. And so we all talked to each other and how things were going and da 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 da. And uh, a guy who was a very close friend of mine and had taken a congregation in Colorado had uh, felt a call from God to become increasingly Pentecostal while remaining in the Missouri Center. So he began on his hospital calls trying to heal people. This caused quite a stir. And the elders of the congregation called a meeting with him and said, you can't heal Luther's. <laughs> Maybe you should found another church. <laughs> so he took that advice and he became also, pastor, and found that he could heal that also. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what you've been missing. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, I've uh, finished writing a book a couple months ago on Matthew 25, and I think it's coming out this spring. And so that's the topic of uh, this Sunday and next Sunday. And then uh, further on in December and January, uh, George might be, uh, I, I've sent him the book, I emailed him the book. Um, and so he might be doing uh, further classes in this course. Uh, occasionally, just so you don't get limited to my voice, um, we'll have you read some of the lines from these notes, and uh, we'll see how that goes. So, to begin with, I think we'll have uh, a reading from Matthew 25. We have one Bible in the room. We don't really have to know that. <laughs> And we, we, oh, wow. Oh, that's right. You can't find them on that. Yeah, so there's one Bible in the room, and we actually had to go outside of this room to find it. <laughs> but uh, the, the uh, reading is from uh, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And since he's only going to read 31 to 46, let me just say, and when you hear Matthew 25, we said, oh, we're getting to the end of the Gospel of Matthew because there's 28 chapters in Matthew. And as Matthew comes to an end, to a conclusion, um, there's more and more a sense of uh, eschatology, of last things, of judgment day. And uh, so earlier in Matthew 25, there is a very famous story, which we all know, the story of the 10 virgins who are supposed to be tending their lamps for a wedding feast, and they're waiting for the bridegroom to get there. And uh, the bridegroom tarries, as maybe Jesus is tarrying. And that by the time a word comes, the trumpets blow, the bride moves on its way, uh, five of the young women, I don't know why we really need to call them virgins, but five of the young women, their oil's gone. So they say to the five people who still seem to have oil, who would borrow some beers, they say, well, if you borrow ours, that we won't have any. So you better go to town and buy some oil and replenish your life. So they do, and of course, they miss the bride groom's arrival. They miss it. So that kind of sets you up for the story that he's now going to read. Like I 
I'm going to be ready. And uh, since I'm a professor, I, I, I imagine it's a test question. So it's now the end of the semester, and there's a test question, and you're going to hear what the test question is. So 31 to 40 seconds. And the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels with him, and he will sit on the throne with his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats on his, at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you are the blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare it for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, when you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Okay, good. Um... So uh, this two-sided piece of paper that you have in your hands, it could be that will be enough for both this Sunday and next Sunday. If uh, we somehow surprise me by tearing through it uh, in one class, then there'll be a new one next time. Uh, what I'd like you to keep in the back of your mind, uh, a few questions are the following. Uh, does this work for Lutherans? Uh, or do Lutherans mostly? I, I saw something that deeply shocked me. Uh, I, uh, when I was still writing the book, I Googled Matthew 25 and I got page after page after page. And one of the things that was on the Google was quite a long essay by an ELCA pastor who is also the head of one of the ELCA's uh, mission outreach to people in need. So you might think that this would be the kind of person who would really have his ear tuned to this. But the theme of his essay was how tired he was getting of Matthew 25. Lutherans don't want to hear about Matthew 25 because it sounds too much like work righteousness. And we live by grace alone. And also, people who are always crowing about Matthew 25, it's as if they're saying they're special. And he's tired of that too. So, like, duh. <laughs> um, to those of us who have been saying for a decade or more that we are an LGBTQ friendly church, a reconciling in Christ church, do people say, oh, they, they think they're so special? Oh, they think they're so pro gay. It's really, I'm really tired of hearing that. So I don't think we would think that that would be true, that people are saying that. But this pastor in charge of outreach to the poor is tired of Matthew 25. So you might keep in the back of your mind whether you think Lutherans are uh, aren't Matthew 25 contagious or whether you feel like you prefer to be not related. Another thing to keep in mind is whether, and uh, this won't be while I'm here, but uh, George might be, and could he be cutting the council and the pastor? And that is, is there any interest in this parish becoming a Matthew 25 parish in the same way that we are a reconciling in Christ parish? So, might we want to call ourselves that? And uh, the reason I got that idea is that when I was still in California, I, I began seeing on the, on the uh, on 
becomes a website, pictures of some of you who carry signs that deal with social justice. And so I thought, wow, how cool that Agnes Day is moving in that direction. Because we sometimes used to think that the people who need social justice don't live in Cape Harbor, they live in Tacoma. And so if you want to cross the bridge, social justice over there, because everybody in Cape Harbor is going to come to the that might even be true. But um, so those might be questions that you keep in the back of your mind. Like that. Who would go for this? Would it be a good idea? Would it not be a good idea? So um, I thought maybe somebody could volunteer to. So where it says, uh, is this really a thing? Because when you are immersed in a book, so I suppose it took me six months to write this book. When you're immersed in a book, you sometimes begin to believe in what you've been thinking about, not thinking about for six months. And you begin to wonder, is this actually happening out there? Uh, I sent my book to Fortress Press, the ELCA Press, which declined to publish it. And uh, but unlike most presses, which just say it doesn't fit our publishing schedule. Uh, I became good friends with the editor at Fortress Press, who was in charge of my manuscript. And so he told me a lot of things that were going on in the conversation. And one of them was, is this really a thing? Like, we don't, we don't really see, does Fortress Press want to publish a book about something that doesn't happen? Heinz thinks it's happening because he wrote a book about it, but we doubt that it's happening. And we haven't noticed that it's happening. And uh, somebody from the Visitor Studies Department in Chico, when I sent them a, a summary of the book, said, Wow, I read the Christian Century every month when it comes out. That's a mainstream Protestant magazine. I read it every Sunday. I don't know anything about it. I'm, I'm tickled to death that it might be true, but I haven't heard anything about it. So is it or isn't it happening? So maybe somebody could read the first sentence under number two. Lord G. One of that. Anyway. I'll read it Okay. Lord G. One wanted to add in concurrent Christian Century magazine. Our activist church is in Matthew 25. Stephen Ministry, Ruth here in climate conservation. This is in northern Wisconsin. Um, and it was a Presbyterian church, and it just made me so happy when I read it in this month's Christian century that somebody we their congregation in the Midwest, northern Wisconsin, recruiting a pastor, wants this pastor to know, by the way. We're a Matthew 25 church. So if that rings your bell, we hope you might uh, apply. But if you would find offensive the idea of a Matthew 25 church, don't apply. Uh, somebody want to read the next sentence? The pledge. Okay, so this comes out of uh, you may know the uh, magazine or the group called Sozerders. It's 50 years old now. It was founded by a guy named Jim Wallace, who went to uh, Wheaton College and then the North Park Seminary in Chicago. And so was he, what he would call it, Neo, he would call it. These days you gotta say Neo, because if you don't say Neo, people think, yeah. So uh, so among the not Neos, there are the kind of people who who put up signs like what in Texas. Uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God one, and the word was 
and now another one that just appeared in Georgia, which I can't memorize, but it's on Facebook, which also said uh, there, there's a word from God, and God has uh, put this person in charge of government. So you have to call yourself a neo evangelical if you want to put Christians in the belt as Christian by evangelicals. So, uh, yes, someone asked what they put them all the time for the book of the book of the book of the book Yes, yes, he did call on the book. Yeah, I, I, I can't really hear what you say. I said, I think he did call on the book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard. Oh, I'm going to have one slide. You know that when he worked that book? Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, I, I'm trying to remember, did the people of this church? Read Jim Wallace's latest book. Um, take it the lesson learned in the course of study. Okay, so he's a pretty famous guy. He has stepped down from being a head soldier and taken his position as a professor of ethics. And he knows his way around Washington, D.C. But right now it's a, a black person who has uh, taken over the membership of. But uh, soldiers uh, and among and a number of neo evangelicals and Baptists have come up with this pledge. So if you don't want to call yourself and take a microphone back, Christian, then you just have to take a pledge. Um, pledge is I pledge to protect and defend vulnerable people in the United uh, red letter Christians. I don't know if you know about that group, but uh, some of you may have grown up all over the place. Most of you have been. There were editions of the King James Bible that put all of Jesus' words in red letters. And so maybe 20 years ago, this group of people who said we needed to get back to hearing what Jesus actually said. Um, and so they began calling themselves red letter Christians. So I'll just read this one. The red letter Christian said, Matthew 25 is rising up in the face of a new political Trump regime that is making many people feel so afraid. Okay. Um, I want to pause here because I didn't necessarily need to go this far out on the list. It's surely within the possibility that some or many of you are Republicans. And so I don't want to imply that this is just for leftist Democrats. Okay. Uh, the whole argument is that the whole church is being called to own, to own up to Matthew 25. And there are Democrats who don't want to own it. And there are Democrats in our district, and we were right to them, then we might. And if they're Republicans, well, what the rest of the world calls an offering of letters, where you send your Congress people letters saying, I'm a Christian, I'm also deeply patriotic, and I want you to know what one of your constituents is thinking. In fact, that's now the topic of the next sentence here. There's a group called the Gospel Coalition. I don't actually know this group, but you can find it. And here's their statement. What Jesus says in Matthew 25 is not conservative or liberal. It's Christian and has everything to do with how we treat others. It's actually in our interest to make well, I'm going to, as we get on, I'm going to say the opposite too. So, so, so I'm going to say that we should become political with our social gospel because we should try to build it into the law of the land. 
we should try to increase food stamps for the poor. We should work for universal health care. And uh, we should try to avoid saying, yeah, if you're a lefty, you really want this. If you're a Republican, we're really writing you up with different jobs. You didn't want to avoid that in the church, um, especially in the Midwest. There are a lot of PLC Muslims who are Republican. And the, how foolish it would be to write them all off and say this is advice for lefty Democrats. Because in a way, you're giving the gospel away. Uh, when Jesus gathered all the world, he doesn't say, now the left wingers here, I'm guessing they're going to pass the test. And the right way for that is not going to pass the test. No, there's nothing, there's no hint of that. It's just here all you are, and here are the test questions. Not about left or right. Here are the test questions, and are you fair or yes. And then I was so pleased I never do this, and I wrote back to Board of Press. I think you have heard about the ELC in Southwest California. District, haven't you? So the ELCA Southwest California, so that's the LA San Diego area. Um, and Orange County. Yes, and or that's right, good point. And Orange County, historically a Republican territory. Not now. But not now. They <laughs> they moved. Right. Although a couple of the most notorious conservative Republicans are from that area, although more from the valley, but I don't say that. Um, so the ELCA Southwest California District and its bishop, um, who I think started out from Missouri Synod. Uh, there are many ELCA bishops who used to be Missouri Synod and crossed over. Um, so I was, uh, this actually happened uh, four years ago. Join Matthew 25 churches throughout Southern California as we pray with dreamers and their families on Dreamer Sunday, March 4th, 2018. So uh, I was stunned when I saw that because I hadn't seen much from the ELCA and nothing from the Missouri Center. We can stay in touch uh, about these issues. So it just shows uh, if you look around, it's that. Wow. I just want to mention that the bishop uh, of that synod for years, Murray Kate, who was the Lutheran Church for very synod, and she's also associate pastor with me in Fresno. Also, um, the current bishop, Murray to get hired, the current bishop is, is from all places, uh, from all places of, from Fresno. He comes out of a uh, very conservative. Uh, well, David's Lutheran tradition mm. and then Andy Taylor. Mm. Yeah. So, so they're not from the Bay Area. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I would end up of the Northern California. Is it Fred? No. Yeah, that's right. That's why I was, yeah. Yeah, the, Cal the California Nevada Synod would really is heartland in the Bay Area. Um, and the person who came in, so they just elected the Cramps person. And the person who came in second by only three votes was gay. So, like, not everybody celebrated. <laughs> um, uh, I'm on their Senate website on Facebook, and uh, a tremendous amount of abuse was uh, posted on those uh, their Senate websites that it was further evidence, if you needed it, that the ELCA. We hardly be called Christian anymore. It's painful. I mean, this is the church of my childhood. Uh, but uh, it's thematic. And, and it's very gross. Yes. The Lutheran uh, ELCA and go back to the old ELCA. But uh, there was a, a disenfranchising the Methodist Church because they were too socially active yes. and not religiously uh, theological. Yeah, yeah. 
And in fact, you may be aware that for, for two years running now, the Methodist Church is on the verge of splitting in two over the day. Yes. Now, I'm guessing it's probably true that the African churches, many of them are anti-Jewish citizens who don't do African culture. They would like Matthew 45. They need Matthew 45. They, they, they need first world relief and the Muslim world direction, world direction, world vision. So they, they desperately need it and practice it themselves. Uh, I've noticed that anytime somebody from Uganda becomes a Facebook friend to me, you can only delete those five for them. So let me just say what number three is doing. As I was writing the book, and after uh, I was chastened by uh, Fortress Press telling me they don't think it's a good thing, uh, and it's not really as typical of Lutherans who talk about Matthew 25 a lot, who can talk about the election. Uh, John was the capital of God, was Luther's favorite, Luther's only favorite gospel. And famously, James, who said, Hey, if I look at you and I don't see good works, I can doubt your Christianity. For that, Luther called James an epistle of straw. So there is a certain tradition in Lutheranism that has a hair trigger response to something that sounds like a test. But it's pretty hard not to say Matthew 25 isn't a test. I mean, it's practically a quiz there. So, uh, as I was uh, about halfway through writing my book, I thought, what is going to be the best way to argue that there is or there could be a Matthew 25 movement in Christianity? Just American Christianity. And so I moved to something that I know about, which I'll come to a little later. But uh, when I was at the Grand Union Lot of Provision in Berkeley in 1975, we had uh, what was again, big Ford Foundation grant, and it was a so called New Religious Consciousness Project. And it was in the Bay Area. And people were looking at uh, Earhart Seminar training and so on. I was the only one of that Christian project. And my project was on vision. And but I'll come back to that later. Here I want to make this point that the idea that there could be a movement that starts out small and becomes successful is as old as Christianity itself. In fact, the whole evolution yeah. of historic Christianity is one movement after another. And typically, those movements start out with one or two persons, and then they grow. In my book, I talk about how the same thing happened with Buddhism. Carol um, and I visited the site of a Buddhist emergence in Northeast India. And, and what we created is about that, that means so and so forth to contribute to our friends so they could do our like it's cold water. Um, so, that's, so that's the way Buddhism took off. And uh, you think of Mormonism spreading west across the United States, originally with one guy, and so forth. Shiite and Sunni Islam 
So sociologists of religion, which I consider my own discipline, they are accustomed to looking for signs of new religious movements in worldwide religion and how they either succeed or fail, how they sometimes fall by the wayside, how they sometimes suffer such persecution that they don't survive, or their original leader is so wacko or becomes so wacko that nobody can find a uh, reason to, to get with it. But uh, so I've listed some here. I'll, I'll just read these. But my the, the thesis is from the first century to today, Christianity is a string of new religious movements clothed in a particular social, sometimes social economic situation. And then it took off and grew usually because of how powerful the ideas were and how much integrity the person who founded the movement had. Um, so I, I go back, I start all the way back to the Old Testament. You might remember from Sunday school days, this is a great story, but we don't read the Old Testament that much. But in the seventh century BC, when Josiah is the, the king, um, and of uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, and they decide that as part of their renewal, they're going to refurbish the temple. This is Solomon's temple from 1000 BC. So they decide they're going to refurb. I love this story. They're going to refurbish the temple. And so they got people looking through all the back rooms, like, you know, maybe nobody's had been in some of these rooms for centuries. And one day in the back room, they find a book, and we think it's the book of Deuteronomy. It's just stunning. And uh, they go to a priestess, by the way, a woman, uh, and they show her, and she is stunned. She says, We got to take this straight to the king. The king looks at it and he rents his garments, which is what you do when uh, you're having a big response to something. And repentance, and he immediately announces that there must be repentance throughout the land because we have forgotten all of this. We have gone so far from the book of Deuteronomy, and which, if you take the traditional day, would be uh, 8,000 BC. Um, and it's, it's sometimes called in the literature a discarded image. You kind of, you know, maybe find it in your house and you say, oh, yeah, I remember my mom was really into this. But, you know, I can't even remember it anymore. I didn't even remember where my mom was. I didn't remember what it was about. And she said, oh, yeah, we used to think that was important. So the so called discarded image, and of course, the punchline is. Is Matthew 25 a discarded image? Is it mostly not one of the biggies? Um, a little later, I'll, I'll just take this punchline now. Can you imagine if you're watching a football game, a professional football game on television, and every year there's always some eager evangelicals who are holding up a big sign, John 316, and this is their Christian witness. And they know that millions of Americans are seeing them wave the sign, John 3.16. Now, just imagine that in a couple of years, somebody will hold up a sign, Matthew 25. Oh, is, it it's, is it happening? Yeah, yeah it's just stunning that, that this could be happening. And so, again, the bunch sign here, do we want to really be at the back of the line? Or do we want to? I'd like to go back to the next question, um, and that is this is stuff that Jim Rawls talked about three years ago. And so, what happened to that? Is that just, but he talked about that very thing about, I remember that, about 
football stadiums were trying to win that So what happened with that whole this is really good start yeah. So what happened to that? You know, I don't know. Uh, I would say maybe it's slower getting off the ground than we hoped for, or than we or than we uh, predicted. Um, and maybe there were people like Fortress Press, the ELCA Press, who said it's a really interesting thing. Sounds weird. Yeah, it's not your point five. But I think you're exaggerating to say it's a new move. I was going to say it's another indication that Matthew 25 is, is much less known in the popular world than John 3 16 is. Totally. Oh. Yeah. I wish I should jump in. Maybe Fortress Press is totally cool with Matthew 25. They just didn't make my book as good. If you're an author, you are accustomed to being rejected. Uh, Carolyn's an author. She was rejected. And so that's just, that's just, that's just, that's just the way life is. So I don't want to keep, keep pulling the fire on, on Fortress Press. But they did say in one of their letters to me that but, uh, this movement kind of thing uh, that we see throughout the history of the Christian church. Uh, it, it's, it's like Reformation, uh, and, and I think it's related to, it's related to both the personal sense that I got it perfect, which is coming from an imperfect person, uh, and so there needs to continually be uh, these kinds of reforming, uh, in tuned in to, to the message of God, the Spirit of God. Uh, and uh, you know, this is one of those times, but it's not the only time. And once we get through it, we haven't uh, got too perfection. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, we should maybe pause to remind ourselves to speak out our Christian ethic for humility. So it doesn't sound like I'm Matthew 25, that's you are. <laughs> See, that's what makes some of these listeners go crazy. Because they think, oh, it's those damn evangelical and a Baptist works righteousness people who are just so proud of themselves that they're wearing a badge with Matthew 25, and uh, they wonder how come we are. So yeah, you could probably spoil the movement by being self-righteous. Um, I don't know if I can say this right, but one of the things <clears throat> when you talk about that it is a test, uh, I think of God as being very loving. And so we don't want to be doing something like this just to pass a test because then that's exactly. trying to get to heaven exactly. by works exactly. as opposed to deeds. Yeah. The other thing is that um, this has to be done if you're doing this. It could just be any type, type of social program that does this, but it has to be done right. in, with Christ. Right, right. I got uh, this will be jumping the gun, and I'm, we're not really going to get there, and so I've already sent this section of my book to George. The, the question of, so there's a there, there's a, a discipline that the Germans invented called Mirfungsgeschichte, which means the history of effects. So how did Matthew, what effects did Matthew have over the centuries? Another question would be, what effects did Paul have, say Paul, have over the centuries? You'd have to say, with the exception of Augustine, fifth century, Paul is not big, and Galatians and Romans are not big. The Luther, in a sense, rediscovers them and makes them the center of the Bible. What Luther called the canon within the canon. Like the whole Bible is a canonical uh, thing that we recognize as God's word. But within the canon, there are little canons that are normative for everything else. And German Luther said, I love this seminary called these the canon within the canon. So John 3.16 is the obvious canon within the canon. But for Luther, it's not what you depicted, of course, it is. But for Luther, it's relationship. 
grace, 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 grace. And uh, so Lutherans know about such things. So let me let me move forward. Jesus is another wonderful story. And it could be that maybe just as some Christians don't actually know by heart the Matthew 25 story, I'm guessing many Christians don't know by heart that Jesus is only in Luke, Jesus inaugural service. So it's very dramatic. Jesus walks into the synagogue in Nazareth. This is just, it's only a little after his baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. It's only a little after that. And he now returns to northern Palestine, Galilee. And he walks into the synod, and Luke is setting it up. All eyes were upon him. He gets up, he opens the scroll of Isaiah, and this is what he picks. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. See, if you don't like Matthew 25, how about the good matter to go to the poor? Good news to the poor. Good news to the poor. Now, originally, that was going to be the title of my book. Good news to the poor. Interestingly, I might have thought, for the poor, okay, this is good, but Jesus. Quoting Isaiah said, Good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive. Just listen to this. You know, if you're arguing with fellow Lutherans or other evangelicals or Catholics or whoever, and they say, You know, I think you're getting a little carried away. You sound a little too much like FDR or New Deal or Leftist Democrats or something. Is this, is this really what, uh, what Jesus is, is saying? And there's a famous line that some evangelicals like to keep Jesus on the cross so he doesn't have any speaking parts. And because if he actually has speaking parts, it's going to be pretty clear what he's pitching. So here he's pitching Isaiah. And I mean, this could be, you know, we could we could say to uh, Seth, Seth. Uh, could you maybe begin every single sermon you preach with release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free, proclaim the years of the Lord's favor. And then there's this dramatic moment, all eyes are upon him. He closes the scroll and he says, This is coming to you. Not everybody rejoiced. In some other versions of this, uh, they want to think about the kind of storm on the cliff. It was a whoa, whoa. I mean, how arrogant are you? You claim to be the fulfillment of the great prophet Isaiah. And in fact, you said, yeah, in space. Um, so, uh, okay, I'll go on. Let's look at that. I just want to say that the, the political. Uh, uh, sociological situation for Jesus and the people at this time was the domination by Rome, where they were, where they were in a sense, all in captivity. Yeah. So there's a there's a political dimension here. I don't know how you want to deal with that. So you know, but it's yeah. curious that it's here. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's often said, and this is, uh, I would guess, this is only maybe since success was in seminary wasn't quite so big when I was in seminary. And that is, there's a whole group of New Testament scholars who are putting all their bets on um, curious Christus. Christ is Lord. Because wait a minute, Caesar is Lord. And so the whole literature. So when you hear the word curious, K-Y-R-I, -I, okay, we hear the word Curious, you assume they're talking about the Roman Emperor. And now Christians are going around saying, Curious Christmas, which becomes a direct challenge to the supremacy of empire and an argument that, in fact, the reign of God is now a period. Uh, I'm writing another book right now in which I say, 
Can you try to repeat the Lord's Prayer? You told me about me. But I, I learned from all my years that you say Lord's Prayer without thinking much about it. You know, you just go through it. So I often, I would say this to myself. So when Seth leads us in the Lord's Prayer, I say the Lord in German. Because we have to do it. Uh, but it makes me think about it. Uh, different think about each one of those words. Whereas I can just mumble jumble along in, in English. And uh, I read something a couple of weeks ago that said, how about if you say, uh, our father who art in heaven, thy empire from <laughs> What? <laughs> See, it's not so much that that's a better translation, but it makes you think. Because then you think, wow, thy empire comes, so you mean not Rome, not Rome, thy empire. And uh, the reign of God, could be translated that way. In fact, what's in right now, because kingdom is a gendered word, king, judge, uh, so it's male. So there are attempts to say the reign of God, which is ungendered, but empire would also be ungendered. Um, okay, so, not, so that's Jesus. Now, Paul, so Paul, you know the story. Everybody knows the story, the master's story. The whole world knows the master's story. You can learn about it in college where the where was the, the topic, the topic, because it's a great conversion story in the Western tradition. So Paul is persecuted Christians. He's on his way to uh, grab some up and take them back to Jerusalem, possibly for um, a capital punishment uh, if they can't pass the, uh, the Jewish establishment. So Paul's playing high stakes. He gets knocked off his horse. He becomes momentarily blind. Jesus says, Paul, oh, Paul, oh, what's up with you? This is Jesus, the risen Christ, talking. And uh, then through, it, it actually, the book of Acts that tells us how this elaborated. Uh, but Paul is, 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 is told, you have a message that transcends Judas. It transcends the temple in Jerusalem. It's it'll look it'll play in Athens. It'll play in Ephesus. It'll play in Rome, none of the Jewish strongholds. So God is doing something and you are taking it public. Now that proved irresistible. Not everybody thinks this is useful and something that John might be cute. But uh, you may know MIT, the initial public offering. And to make sure I knew what I was talking about, I read up on IPOs some months, months ago. And uh, if you are a private investor uh, that thinks you really got the world by the leg and that you are uh, this investment opportunity, is uh, extremely promising, but it hasn't, it's not a public offering. And you announce and develop a sophisticated pitch for an initial public offering. Why? It's not just your own benevolence. It's that if you can get all kinds of hedge funds and millionaire or even billionaire investors, you can blow this thing off the map and it becomes the biggest deal around. Okay, so I took some pleasure using a Wall Street metaphor to make my point, just because it's so unlike the type of point I just made. And uh, I, I'm saying this is what Paul did. He did an initial public offering that said, wait a minute, what you used to think was confined to Jerusalem Judaism is now on offer to the whole world. And the IPO person thinks that it's precisely all kinds of people buying in who will jump start this thing. So now we're back to Matthew 25. And in fact, there's a there's a hedge fund called 1925. It's one of these things where you say, wouldn't you like to make moral investments? So you not only make a lot of money, but you can be kind of morally proud. It's like a ethics investment. So you can find if you Google it on the 18th uh, line of uh, you, you can find that there are funds 
name Matthew 25 funds and you address from them and then the profits come to you or automatically come to the world library or you give it away. Uh, okay, I'm just going to quickly do the, the rest of these. So that's that's Paul. So that's another religious movement. Then St. Augustine, so 350 to 430 is Augustine, 354 to 430 is Augustine's time. And Augustine is living among people who are saying the Roman Empire is collapsing because of the Christians. You, you weaken all this moral process. You have weakened the culture of Rome and the empire is growing up. And Augustine, the most brilliant of the church fathers, one who Luther's writing to him, Augustine says, well, you could say that, but here's what I'm saying. Christianity could embed itself in the culture of Rome and the emerging Middle Ages to such an extent that Christianity becomes the heart of the Western tradition. But today, we are talking about, we all talk about the Western tradition, but it's a post colonial tradition. But Augustine brings this off and it worked for a thousand years, all the way through the Middle Ages. From 500 to Luther's day, Augustine is where Christianity is the version of Christianity and of the West and of Europe that is. Are you letting me know? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so that's Augustine. Then in the sixth century, Benedict is saying, you know, Christianity is really becoming successful ever since. Um, Constantine. Constantine. Ever since Constantine uh, converted in 305, 315, and Christianity became the religion of the empire, Benedict comes on and says, Yeah, that's true. How well, nice. You're not being persecuted anymore. But did he, did he get watered down too? So Augustine said, What if we develop what I'm going to call monasticism? And what if monasticism becomes the chief? of authentic Christianity, which the lay audiences out there in every town can look to as what we should all be aspiring to. Um, I'll close with this because it's ironic. Two years ago, a guy named Dreher, D-R-E-H-E-R, -E um, wrote a book called The Benedict Option. Huge bestseller. Huge. So when I started reading it, I thought, oh, this is going to be it. So about five or 10 pages in, it turns out Rod Dreher thought that what Christianity needs, just as Benedict thought it needed to be different, it needs to become anti gay and anti abortion. And that will return it. To its historic authenticity. Meanwhile, we should acknowledge we have lost the culture wars. Christianity has lost out because the culture is pro abortion and pro gay. We lost that. So we should regroup. We should spend most of our time inward on retreats, founding Christian schools, not public schools, and developing. Uh, a response that's anti-gay and anti-abortion that could return the supremacy of Christianity and rescue it for the 21st century. So I did read the book all the way through, but it turned out to be that exactly what I was hoping for. Okay, so we'll stop here and then you get this sheet with you. And uh, we'll move forward next time. Thank you. Thank you.